The Monerotopia Price Report segment is sponsored by Local Monero. Avoid using KYC exchanges. Buy and sell Monero directly for fiat, peer-to-peer. Good morning, buddy, there. Hello, hello. We got buddy, is he around? Yeah. Oh, wait, Gentlemen. Oh, there he is. Hey, buddy. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> What's going on, man? Uh, just chilling, having a good time. Sweet. Um, my sound is not quite perfect right now. It's not I bad. That's fine to me. Yeah. Um, you sound a little okay, over, but other than that, you say. <laughs> I'm I'm getting like my own voice on an echo here. Oh shit! Okay. No, that's that's fine. No. You have you have the headphones? You got headphones? Yeah, yeah, I got the headphones. Mm. I'll just ignore me. All right, that's As annoying usual. though. That's that's hard to do. What changed? I don't know what changed. No, it's my fault. I just there's like a configuration I haven't set. Okay. Anyways, so we got a jam packed show today. I'm actually really excited to hear about the um, the atomic swaps because we can go both ways now. Yeah, that's that's big news, and it's my understanding it's working. So we'll we'll have them on. We could uh, please stick around for that if you can, buddy. So we could you know ask them ask them some questions, some technical for questions. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I've got my own questions. Yeah, exactly. I'm sure uh, I'll answer them. But, uh... Yeah. Okay, so um, nothing happened with price, and uh, we can move on. <laughs> Good talking to you. <laughs> all right yeah but we'll keep it short if you want it's like august it's kind of funny right this is this is a thing though right in the broader markets isn't august always like doldrums with and then like september things start up again there was um i think in 2015 and this is like when i first started paying attention to markets was um there was like a massive crash in the stock market i say massive but it was like a big crash but i don't know i think the plunge protection team came in and like stopped everything I think it crashed like 20%. Um, in, go ahead. In August? Uh, it was August 2015. I, no. I'm pretty sure it was August. Maybe it was September. Actually, you know, we've got this like cool application here that can tell us when that actually happened. Hmm. All right. So we're looking at the NASDAQ here. Um, maybe we should go to like the weekly or something. That was a while ago. 2015. Uh, Is NASDAQ? No, it doesn't. Yeah, that was August. Okay. August oh, wow. 17th. Yeah, I don't remember. So the last act of August was about eight years ago <laughs> for the stock market. That was 2015? Yeah. Mm, okay. I'm trying to take myself. That was kind of like, that was like right before I had started getting into cryptocurrency. I was like, I think Ron, what happened is Ron Paul came back on the horn and I saw some commercial. I was like watching TV and Ron Paul popped up and I was like, man, I should really get back into the Liberty thing. Like I'm lazy <laughs> for the last Those five were my years. BTC maxi days from like, uh, 2014, 2015. That's uh, yeah, so, so probably around that time I, I was rooting for the crashes to try to grab, grab more Bitcoin before we really understood yeah. Forgive me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want the global economy to collapse. Like that would be bad for me and bad for basically everyone too. Yeah. Well, I was being selfish. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, but yeah, any less than eight years ago. Any 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 bigger, broader news? I, I haven't been following price action at all. But yeah, anything to of note? Uh, we got the CPI. Okay. Uh, so the CPI came out on Thursday, um, and it looks like the core has dropped a little bit. So core inflation is um, all of inflation minus uh, energy and food. So we dropped just a little bit there. For the first time in since looks about a year, the CPI actually bumped up just slightly. Uh, we we went up by like. I don't know, 0.1%. Um, I I think a lot of people are starting to realize that or come to some kind of agreement that the CPI is probably going to be sticky. Um, it's it's going to be difficult to get these numbers back down to like the Fed's quote unquote target of 2%. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll look back here just a little bit so that we can have some kind of reference. 
you'll notice that, so the orange line is kind of the important line that we really want to look at. The core CPI is what the Fed looks at and energy and food can vacillate, but the core CPI um, is sort of like all goods. Um, at any rate, what we want to do is get back down to kind of these historical levels. And that's going to be pretty hard to do, I think. So historical levels would be somewhere around like this area right here. Uh, it's, a, it's a very rough estimation. Um, so you can see that basically the producer price index, so what manufacturers are paying for their products or to manufacture their products, is pretty close to back in trend. It's not exactly back in trend. Um, but here's the CPI. And then here's the, the core inflation. It, and and by, by the way, obviously, this is assuming that they're um, manufactured, fabricated, slash, um, I don't know, the, the numbers that they, that they fuck with. This is assuming that what happened back here is equivalent to what's happening right here in terms of their reporting. And that's not necessarily a good assumption because they're always kind of like fiddling or fucking with the with the way they calculate CPI. Um, so, for example, it, one assumption they have is that oh well, if 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 inflation is high, uh, people won't buy uh, prime rib or ribeye anymore. They'll they'll go buy spam, the, the canned meat, and that's probably not the best assumption that they could make. Um, so there's like all of these adjustments they started doing in the 80s to to sort of fudge the numbers towards the downside. Um, but at any rate, like I, I do think it's important to try and think inside of their little paradigm so that we can understand like how they think and, uh, maybe how the plebs think. And, and also just to have like some kind of basis by which we can, we can compare today to yesterday. So given their fudged numbers, what we really want to see is this core inflation, which is currently at 4.7. We want to see this thing get back down to here. We want to see it get back into trend uh, with what happened basically for the last 20 years since like the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, right now, that's not happening. And you can see it's it's actually very sticky. Like while we've had a nice big drop in the uh, in the producer price index and the CPI, the core inflation has not really wanted to come down. Like we're still kind of just barely, barely, barely getting down. Anyways, and um, core, so we have like the core inflation numbers come out and... Yeah, they they, they weren't great, but they're not terrible either. I mean, can <laughs> all things considered with what they did uh, in the crazy events of 2020, which shall not be mentioned. Um, one thing I hadn't been paying attention to, I guess, for a while is the M2. So the M2 is actually bumped up slightly. These numbers are delayed by like 30 days, 45 days. So the last data we have is from June 1st. Obviously, that's about two months ago. Um we had a big bump up in the M2, which is interesting to me. Maybe it's not that surprising, though, because the stock market is, has gone up. Like, probably banks are giving loans, and the M2 has increased because of all the loans that are happening, um, which is why we've seen reasonably positive action in the stock market. Um, one thing I also wanted to show you guys was the, uh, the IMF. Okay, so <laughs> back in... Um, Back in March, we had a chorus of crypto bros that were explaining how the dollar was mid-collapse and the whole world was going to reject it for world reserve currency, and it was over. And I presented to them the International Monetary Fund uh, chart, which sort of breaks down which fiat currencies are used as reserves. They also use gold as reserves, and I, maybe there's some other um, reserve assets that central banks hold. Uh, I'm not totally sure, but at any rate, we were, the data that we had was for Q4. And I remember saying, listen, guys, the the U.S. dollar is still something like 55 or 54% used as central bank reserves. And the chorus of crypto bros told me how wrong I was and how that was going to collapse very soon. Um, so we got the most recent data. I think it was like a couple weeks ago. I meant to show you guys this uh, last week, but... Anyways, uh, the situation changed just slightly, and the U.S. dollar is slightly more dominant as of Q1. So it doesn't look like the world is rejecting the U.S. dollar as central bank reserves. And this kind of makes sense because no nation or hardly any nation 
really wants to open up their capital markets and export their currency in such a way that um, erodes their manufacturing base. For example, China would be your first, like that would be the first person you'd look at, right? But China is a mercantilist country that does, that basically makes their money on exports. Why on earth would they want to open up their capital markets and erode their manufacturing base? That's their source of power. And they're still industrializing. Like there's still a lot of China that's not um, like, that's not up to date, you know, with the latest technology that's still kind of like living uh, 50 years ago. Anyways, the point is that the dollar still looks pretty sound, still looks pretty good, um, quote unquote good. Please don't hang me. I don't mean good as in like the absolute sense. I just mean the relative sense. Uh, so, and in the relative sense, we'll look at the Dixie. Um, I've drawn some extra lines here and this is just me trying to make sure that I'm not interpreting a chart in a wrong way. So we've got uh, this line here. We've got that line there where I'm, I'm basically trying to draw the chart or draw the line as shallow and as steep as I possibly can so that I can have a good range to understand um, where I might be able, like where I might be wrong. Because um, let's, let's move these lines out over here for a moment. So right now we're sitting basically at this level. And we've talked about for a while that that this line here that started back in uh, in at the end of 2022 is probably going to end up breaking to the upside. At some point, this thing is going to move to the upside, and the dollars the dollar index is going to make a big strong comeback. Um, this is strength. Like looking at this chart right here, this is strength. Now I know that we saw this like crazy crash right here, and it totally it totally fooled me. Um, I was like, oh crap, like we might, we might really actually be about to go into some kind of, um, I don't know, like massive explosion of risk assets and everything was going to, was going to pump big. Um, but when, so this thing crashed, but when this thing got back up above here and then closed another couple days above, that's, that was basically telling you like, no, this was a fake out because normally what you would want to see is like, this would, this would drop. You'd come up to this line. You would maybe try and get back up. And then down here would signal that, okay, mad gains are on the way. Um, but that's not what happened. This was just a fake out. All of this was just a fake out. So anyways, right now we're basically sitting at this line again, and this is strength. You, you bump up against this line multiple times. You expect that you're eventually going to break it. So the thing that I wanted to show you guys with um, with the downsloping lines here uh, was that there's kind of like this extra zone, if you will, where it's like, okay, we broke the line. This is the main line right here. This is the most important line. But there's still kind of like you could still, if you really wanted to try and draw it, you know, in a different way on the daily, not using the wick, but using the close price on the daily. Um, we could we could say that this is kind of another extra zone. And uh, a lot of people that call charting astrology would criticize this notion and they wouldn't be wrong. <laughs> um, but it's it's just important to to do this because it's really easy to get carried away. Say we broke the line and now we're gonna go up and you know, I'm taking all my shorts on the stock market or whatever because dollar index broke the line. So and, and anyways, um, this is just kind of like a thing that you should do if you're if you're a degenerate trader, if you're an astrologer chart person, um, just make sure that you're you're drawing the lines in all the ways they might be able to be drawn. And you'll probably sa save yourself some pain by doing so. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at Monero. Now, let's look at the big picture. There was a guy, uh, Monero Tony, good guy on uh, on twitter and he asked me how do you look at the volatility of various assets there's actually quite a few ways to do it there's like implied volatility um there's like a few major um ways that people look at it the way that i prefer to look at it involves standard deviations um and that's what these blue lines are so if you were to take the moving standard deviation so think of it like moving average but moving standard deviation uh, what you would have here is how wide is that standard deviation, right? So, for example, if you have price that's oscillating wildly, the standard deviation is going to be significantly larger. 
if you have price that is constrained to a narrow band, the standard deviation is going to be much, much lower. Now, the question here is how many days back do you want to look? You could look back 10 days, 100 days, 1,000 days. And so that's what all of these blue lines are right here. These are different look back periods. It's exactly like moving average. You might look back at the 10-day moving average or the 100-day moving average or the 1,000-day moving average. Um, for Monero, I think we've only got maybe 3,000. Let's take a look here. We've got about 3,300 bars, days, because uh, we're on the daily, uh, of data. So basically what I do, just like I've showed you guys with the wave magic, we, we plot them all together. Um, and then we, we look at where the clusters are. So what's happening right here is that Monero's, uh, Monero's volatility has dropped off to its lowest ever. Like all of this clustering here that you see at the, at the bottom right, maybe we can expand that just a bit. Um, all of this clustering right here is indicating that we have very, very low volatility, or, or at least for the lifetime of the chart. Um, the other thing that we have is the long, long-term standard deviations are still falling from the 2017 uh, kind of blow off, blow off top. Um, so typically when we're looking at, um, people would call them Bollinger, Bollinger Bands. Um, I just call it volatility or wave magic or standard deviation analysis. Um, what, what you see normally with charts is that when you get a constrained volatility, when you, when you get sort of compressing volatility, it acts as a spring. And personally, what I think is that the market loves to speculate. So what they do is they decide, okay, we're going to, we're going to speculate on the price in some direction, whatever, and it's going to get carried away with itself. And it happens all the time. You've seen it everywhere in basically every asset. And then after that blow off or crash or whatever, which, whichever direction it, it, it's going, um, the market decides, Hey, you know, we've been really irrational for kind of a while. So let's, let's just chill out and, uh, let's try and establish like whatever the real price is here. Right. We, we, we speculated as much as we can and, uh, let's try and let, let's just try and cool off and, and figure out what the real price of this asset is. So in a lot of ways, that's kind of what happens, um, with every asset. And when you see this constraining volatility and, and you can actually see this on the wave magic, because again, the top blue lines are standard deviation, the upper standard deviation of price, and the orange lines are the lower standard deviation of price. Don't worry about the purple and the red. We're just going to turn that off. It's a little bit more, more than we should get into here today. But the point is that at some point, the market, after having cooled off and, and sort of this volatility compression happens, people start to get the appetite again that maybe we could speculate again. Um, we've decided what the what the real value of the asset is, and now um, let's let's speculate on the future again. And pretty much all assets kind of go, I shouldn't say all assets because stocks are kind of their own animal, but in a broad sense, um, we see this over and over again. So uh, what we've got here with Monero is the what I, again, the wave magic. Uh, which is standard deviation analysis, clustering of bands. Uh, we had the the lower, uh, sorry, the the moving average, which is in white, has been acting as a pretty good support. And you can see the way that these bands have become more and more constrained over time. Um, I do expect that this should eventually break to one direction or the other. <laughs> if we're if we're talking about just like pure chart analysis, you would say this will break to one direction or the other. Obviously, um, Monero is very used in a lot of contexts and it seems to be more and more used. So uh, this is a very long-term chart. This could take till next year. This could even take till 2025 to, to actually really break. So nothing really happened with any of the assets, any of the prices, uh, stock market, cryptocurrency, etc. cetera. Once again, um, Monero just, proving that it's a, a stable coin, you know? Monero is a stable coin, but it seems to me like most of crypto is being stable right now. Yeah, for sure. Good analysis, though. Um, all right, so we might be sitting around to 2025. <laughs> <laughs> we, we could. Like, I don't want to lie to you guys. What, what, what's, your, what's your feel on the broader market, though? Like, I, I kind of ask you this all the time, but, um, you know, what, what's your latest feel? We headed towards... You know, they've been talking about recession all the time. This recession never comes. Tell us the future, body. Yeah, what's what's your latest take? Oh, shit. I left my crystal ball in the bar <laughs> last night. Fuck. 
<laughs> okay, I'll just have to wing it. <laughs> um, let's talk about the, the macro of crypto and then the broader macro. So right now we've got Binance is on the ropes like we've talked about for a while. CZ has been trash talking USDT. He like tried to lost, uh, launch his own stable coin. I'm not, uh, no one believes him. Um, CZ went back to prison. I think we're going to talk about a little bit more about that later today, but the judge doesn't believe CZ or, or sorry, uh, F SBF Sam, Mr. Sam, the bank man, uh, went back to prison. So we've kind of got like good things and bad things. We've got signal counter signal. I think overall in the macro sense, if Binance falls, if Binance is taken down by the justice department or the injustice department, we... We could definitely probably look at crypto taking a big dip there because Binance is kind of the last remaining major exchange. On the other hand, we've got the ETFs. And it does look to me like big corporations are building ETH, quote unquote, L2. It's more like some kind of glorified multi-sig where they can still take your money and they call it L2. Uh, but that should buy them time for like many years until the government catches up with it. Regardless. We've got kind of like these negative price pressures here with the Gox coins and perhaps CZ getting taken down and Binance like having problems. And I'm all for Binance getting taken down. Like, honestly, if we have to endure some price problems, we have endured price problems in Monero for a long time. So, you know, the rest of the cryptocurrency ecosystem. And you'd say a lot of that was caused by Binance. Say again? And you'd say some of that was caused by Binance. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Unresounding. Yeah, uh, unquestionably, they've been reserving or fractionally reserving their Monero assets. And they were such a popular, like CZ was the holy, one of the holy patron saints of cryptocurrency for so long. Are you sure they're even fractionally reserving at this point? Are they wholly reserving? <laughs> no, I mean, just no reserves. Because wasn't they, that uh, in I 2020, that was a thing for banks? And that, no, I don't know. I don't think Binance can do it. But banks, they were they were able to suddenly not reserve any anything oh yeah the um i remember that like they removed one of the last in 2008 or after 2008 they removed one of the last alleged backstops against the printing of money like they don't have to hold it hardly any reserves anymore um i do know that binance does seem to not be shutting down next tomorrow withdrawals like they were last year so that's almost kind of an incredible thing if you think about it. Binance was heavily fractionally reserved to the point that they could barely meet withdrawals, and Monero still performed better in the bear market than pretty much every other coin. So overall macro, what are you saying? There's tail risk. Tail risk is growing. Um, let's take a quick look at the um, at the interest rates. Uh, so we're still not quite like where you would, where you would look at that happened here in 2008, or I'm sorry, uh, that was 2020. This over here is 2008. And then we could like go all the way back to, to, uh, 2001 after the, uh, the crash of the dot com. And you can see that basically the federal funds rate was above everything and it was above everything for a while. Like there's kind of like this flat top table here that happens before things really crash. Same thing here. Um, we're still not like, we haven't reached that tabletop moment. Like there's still, the one year is still above the federal funds rate. So the other thing that's important to keep in mind is that now the Federal Reserve has the reverse repos and they can really kind of like hoist the um, all of the, the rates to the upside. And maybe they can even prevent like a quote unquote recession. Uh, again, these numbers are also they, they fudge all these numbers that it's it's hard to um, it's hard to make heads or tails of them sometimes. Usually the the adjustments they make are slow and steady. So like there's kind of like this bias in the charts um, or bias that you can slowly keep track of rather than like completely changing everything on a whim. Um, let's take a look at the 10 year yield here. Now, when I look at this chart instinctively, I say this thing is ready to pounce to the upside like this. We, we had the breakout. We had the retest here. It came back to the upside. Like this thing looks like it wants to go to the upside. Now 
it's the 10 year yield chart. So you have to realize that it's tied to the federal reserve interest rates. So there's probably some limitation factor that will happen in this chart, even though it looks very bullish. Um, probably if it gets to this level here, right, the, the previous all time high and not all time high, I'm sorry, local high, uh, which would be at about 4.3%, that would end up acting as some kind of um, resistance. But um, overall, in the big macro picture, to answer your question, Doug, I'm sorry for being long winded here. We're, we're looking at a situation where the tail risk events and tail risk means that the potential for some big crash or some like something that only happens once a decade or once every two decades, we are looking at a higher risk for that. Um, but at the same time, there are notable differences. <laughs> it's different this time uh, where maybe we don't have some major, major crash. Um, we have M2 monetary supply for the rest of the world has been continually going up. Um, it's it's just not clear that necessarily we're going to crash. There's kind of a theory by a guy named Russell Napier where he says that to get the, the debt to GDP ratio down, because we have so much, we, it's not my debt. I didn't do it. <laughs> Fuck those guys. <laughs> but the debt to GDP ratio is so high, it's basically... Um, as high as it's ever been. Um, the other time was after World War II. The only way to get that down is they need to keep inflation high and they need to sort of monetize over that debt to GDP. Whether they can do that is, is really a big question. The debt payments or the, the interest payments on the debt have grown quite large. Um, they surprised even me. I didn't think they could even get to 5% without like totally crashing the economy and totally crashing their entire monetary structure, but apparently they've been able to do it. Um, I would say just be careful on the macro. If you own stocks, just, just know that like this is a good spot for a top. Um, there's a few indicators that tell us this. So for example, the, the NASDAQ to the S&P ratio something I keep track of. In good times, people speculate into the NASDAQ because that's tech stocks. And in bad times, they seek the safety of um, dividend-paying, long-term proven stocks, which is typically the S&P. So uh, with the standard deviation analysis or the, the wave magic, we kind of like hit this spot right here. It's very difficult to break above this spot right here. Like this is a very hard limiting factor. It's, it's not like a, a trend line. Like you wouldn't look at this and say, okay, this is a hard, you can't get above this blue line. You would just say this area right here is a hard zone of resistance. And you could say the same thing on, uh, what are we looking at here? The NASDAQ. You would say the same thing on the NASDAQ. When we started approaching the top of this line, I started getting really uncomfortable that things are looking like reversal because these are very long-term charts. And after you make a big move to the downside, you establish a whole cluster of new standard deviations, uh, lower standard deviations. And then you move to the upside, almost never, like maybe one out of 10 times, you'll just hit this line, establish it as support, and then break to the upside. Most cases, you're gonna hit this line. You either will come back to the downside immediately, or you'll oscillate around it for a while and then come back down. So I think macro, just just be careful. Like, don't be betting large amounts on the next on the new bull market upside. I do think that there's a high likelihood that the the overall markets need to move back down. They need to establish some lower range support. Could be higher. Probably will be higher than the last one because um, they're still printing money, obviously. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess that's about it. Maybe there's one more thing we could look at, which is the overnight uh, repurchase agreements. This to me, intuitively, it feels like uh, bottoming structure uh, right here. I mean, everything that's happening down there, that feels a lot like a bottoming structure, um, which would mean that people are getting worried. They don't want to keep pumping money into the stock market. Um, they're, they're finding some reason to, uh, to stop pulling money out of the Federal Reserve overnight repurchase um, facility uh, where they get paid about 5%. So, um, yeah, I guess, I guess that's about it. Like there's really right. like the, the markets themselves were pretty flat. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess we'll just have to see. All righty. Thank you as always, body. Greatly appreciate Thanks, it. Guys.